Okay. Hey, well, uh, good good morning, everyone, and welcome to the Mergers and Acquisitions Forum. Um, I'm Austin Tanette. I'll be your host today and have another uh, really exciting uh, presentation here today. So it's by way of agenda, uh, we're going to, uh, in a couple of minutes, we'll turn it over to uh, Bob Benson, who's got some uh, interesting forum business around a U of H scholarship uh, program that we're uh, kicking off. And then Kyle's going to talk about our new improved website and talk a little bit about the new features and functionality that's going to make uh, enhance the uh, user experience. And then uh, we're really honored today to have Carl Meyer with us, uh, who's going to talk about par powering sales growth using a business operating system. I've heard Carl chat before, and it's a very uh, interesting uh, 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 session indeed. Then, like always, we'll leave a little time at the end for, for Q&A and talk about what's next month. So, um, so at this time, I'll turn it over to uh, to Bob uh, for uh, for your uh, overview. There you go, Bob. Thanks, Austin. Uh, as most of you, I think, know, we have been working a little bit with the Bauer College at the University of Houston. Uh, we're trying to establish a long-term collaborative relationship with them because I think they've got a lot to offer us, and I think we've got a lot to offer them. So. We've been working on that. One of the things that we've been working on is funding a scholarship for one of the uh, graduate students down there that's going into uh, his or her second year. We're about 50% funded on that. We could reuse some uh, people to step up and pitch in some cash. Uh, specifically, we need about $1,100 to complete the funding and hopefully we can get that completed before the start of the fall semester so we can do the award uh, before the fall semester starts. The award is going to be done virtually. We'll have an award ceremony. The names of the uh, funders will be on the scholarship along with the M&A forum and uh, they will be introduced in the uh, award ceremony. Uh, and also we'll carry them on our website as, as funders of the scholarship. So if you're interested in getting your name or your business's name out in the public and especially affiliated with what I think is a really good uh, uh, community relationship uh, opportunity, uh, email me, president at mnaforum.org, I'm sorry. I almost non-profited us, <laughs> and uh, we'll uh, we'll get you taken care of. Thanks, Austin. Good. Yeah, thank you so much, Bob. Good. And then, Kyle, I'd like to turn it over to you and a few few uh, comments on our new and improved website. Thank you, Austin. Um, I think on the next slide you've got uh, a screenshot. Uh, so yeah, that's just a screenshot of the home page. It, it is pretty much finished and going to go live. Uh, this week, and we'll place the current this new one. Um, basically, all the same functionality as far as registering for events, some events. Uh, some of the things we're adding are the YouTube videos we're uploading, created a YouTube channel, um, and they'll be posted on the on the resource tab of the the website. Uh, we'll also be linked to all the different social media. And and just an overall new logo, new look, just more professional. So um, we'll send out an email this week with the, the link to the new site uh, when it gets uh, posted. So yeah. that. great. And just you know, this is Mike. Um, you know, thanks to to Kyle uh, and to Jennifer for all the work they've done. Uh, really excited. It's. Uh, the original site, I think, uh, was cobbled together uh, uh, first by me uh, on a, and then I think working with Bob and, and so forth. And uh, what we've got coming is a very professional look uh, and functionality. Appreciate uh, the work and obviously being virtual as long as we have been, uh, it's going to be important to have a professional uh, outreach, uh, both through the web and through the social media uh, when, fingers crossed, we can all get back together at the Houston Exponential Center and actually uh, share each other's company. So thanks, Kyle. Okay, thank, thank you, Kyle. Kyle.
Okay, uh, Mike. You, since you still, you, since you've got the uh, the mic, uh, please uh, continue. Well, I don't know. Is Jill, is Jill signed on? Uh, Bob, Jill, are you there? Okay. Well, this, as you can see, this is from uh, Jill uh, Mazur, a uh, friend of hers, uh, who is looking for an acquisition. Uh, she wants to uh, head up the company, but she's not intending to. Uh, she, you know, she hasn't got a team, a following, a posse. She's uh, looking to take over uh, an existing and uh, profitable organization that has room to grow. Hope Jill gets a chance to sign on here because I'm looking forward to Carl's talk. Uh, if if uh, you have uh, clients uh, or know of anybody who might be in the market for uh, the sales market side, uh, please get in touch uh, with Jill and, and let her know uh, food, healthcare, and so forth. So trying to we're trying to help buyers, and here we got a live buyer. So. Uh, uh, there's, if you got any ideas, uh, pass them on to Jill, please. I appreciate it very much. Great. Okay, Mike, thanks. I think I still have the floor, don't I? Yeah, you do. I'm, I'm trying to. <laughs> okay. Um, as I mentioned, uh, looking forward to the presentation uh, by, by Carl. Uh, first of all, Carl, apologies. I noticed that I left everything off beside, except your name on the uh, agenda sheet. I apologize for that. <laughs> so, sometimes uh, they get away from you. Um, it, it's interesting. I, I'm trying to remember, Carl, we met probably, uh, has it been 20 years ago? I, it, it, it's Pretty it's close. always enjoyable uh, when you meet somebody that you connect with. And uh, by happenstance, we ended up in the same uh, office suite uh, for a while together. And Carl's been a, uh, a, a good friend, uh, both to my, uh, me uh, personally, but also to the, to the M&A forum. And uh, he's been very successful in helping companies grow. And I think uh, we talked about, uh, and we'll talk some more about uh, getting value out of acquisitions. You're a buyer. Uh, getting value out. And of course, it's all about uh, making two plus two equal five or 10. Uh, Carl's going to tell us uh, the approach that he takes to help companies uh, do that. So Carl, you want to, and again, thanks for uh, for taking the time to put the presentation together. Appreciate it very much. Carl, I'll turn it over to you. Great. Appreciate that. Uh, appreciate that, Mike. Uh, the think uh, the um, hosting and, and coming my way. You should have it now. All right, there you go. Let's see if I can. Uh... Let me see you. Good. And. And just as a reminder to our participants, as uh, as uh, Carl is going through his presentation, if there's any comments or questions, please feel free to put, load them into the chat. We uh, we're gonna have some time at the end. To, if there's anything that's red hot, we'll take it during the during the presentation. But uh, we've got definitely have some time set aside at the end for a little Q and A. Carl, thanks. Excellent, thanks, Austin. So I'm really excited to talk to everybody today about something that you know really motivates me. It's building teams to grow companies. So let's see if the technology here. Um, so I'd like to talk to you about um, business operating systems, give you some examples, and uh, then talk about some case studies. But first, just a little bit about Abundant and myself. Uh, Abundant really focuses on building flexible teams to transform results. And, you know, results can, you know, vary from, you know, company to company, person to person. A lot of companies want to grow and sell. Other people want to buy a company to grow it. Um, other people, it's about not having a boss, reducing stress, work-life balance. It can also be things like, uh, you know, somebody likes to, you know, focus on sales or technology. They can help them do that. They may be serving their customers, providing for family, all sorts of different perspectives there. 
and a little bit more about myself. Um, I've been very fortunate to be part of many ro rapidly growing companies over the years. Uh, this is something that I've been uh, very excited about uh, since I was a kid, literally. Um, real quick story. Uh, when I was 10 years old, my parents came and asked my sister and I if we wanted to go to Disney World. And of course, we were thrilled, couldn't wait. So the day came, we hopped in the car, we we're driving to the airport, and come to find out we we're going to fly on a private jet. You know, my cousins, my grandparents, everybody. So I was, you know, you know, we're driving in an Oldsmobile, so I'm, I'm not understanding this whole private jet thing. So I've got to ask a ton of questions. Um, you know, so my parents are explaining that, you know, a long time ago, my grandfather helped this uh, gentleman get started with his business and lend him some money. And this gentleman has become extremely successful, uh, grew, you know, one company, then another, and eventually became uh, one of the 500 richest men in the United States. And this is his way of kind of paying my grandfather back, uh, thanking him. And so, of course, I'm asking more questions and that kind of kid. And, you know, I asked my parents, well, wait, if we lend him the money, why don't we have a jet? And <laughs> at that point, my, uh, my parents told me to go play with my cousins and, uh, you know, just scoot. So, um, but from that point forward, I really was, you know, very fascinated with, you know, why does one company grow and another not? I mean, my, my grandfather was reasonably successful and did fine, but, you know, this other gentleman was phenomenally successful and, you know, what's the difference? So within a couple of years, I was reading the Wall Street Journal and a few years, you know, later, you know, off to college, study economics and then later information systems, so on. And um, over the years, you know, had opportunities working all different types of businesses, all different functions of business. And so what I've done is I've uh, pulled together what I call the abundant framework, and that's my business operating system that I've developed. So let me talk a little bit more about what is a business operating system. Well, to me, a business operating system is a comprehensive set of tools designed to do uh, several things. It's about creating teams, and those teams need to do things like communicate clear direction. I mean, if you don't know where you're going, you know, we all know that you're not going to get there. Uh, and we need to communicate in a way so we can resolve the issues in the organization so that we can adapt, thrive. And we're going through COVID right now. We, a lot of adapting is taking place right now. Um, we also need to communicate with our people so that they feel safe and confident to be able to do their work and you know, really kind of be engaged and be you know, the most productive that they can. So through all this, uh, you know, I'm reminded of an Eisenhower quote that leadership is the art of getting someone else to do something because he wants to do it. So, so with that in mind, you know, one of the things that, you know, I see is that businesses always have an operating system and you know, they can vary widely. Um, we've all seen bureaucracies, uh, you know, government, big companies, where it's all about follow the rules, follow the rules. And, you know, that can work well. You know, you have a lot of structure. Uh, people do what they need to do. But you know, it may not be a, a very attractive place to work. And it's certainly not a flexible, adaptable type of structure. And on the other end of the extreme is what I call a commune. This is a uh, something you might see with a small professional organization, uh, services company, where we all get together and we make the major decisions together. And so, you know, commune may have a slightly different perspective, you know, kind of connotation, but it's about group decision making. But by far for small and lower middle market companies, the most common type of operating system that I've seen is I describe as the starfish method. And this is um, this description was given to me by an Arthur Anderson tax partner about 25 years ago. And what he described was, you know, you picture a starfish and in, in the middle, you know, you've got the body of the starfish. Well, that's the owner of the company. And the owner of the company, you know, talks to each of the legs. So the legs are, you know, sales and accounting and legal and operations and so forth. But just like a star, the legs of a starfish, 
the, the legs never touch each other. So it all goes through the owner. It's all, um, you know, that one key decision point. And honestly, that works pretty well, you know, up to a certain point. However, of course, that owner becomes the bottleneck. You know, all, everything's running through them. So the limits on their time and attention limits the growth of the company. So what's the other option? Well, it's what I'd describe as a formal operating system. So let's talk about that just a little bit more. So what I've seen over the years is that formal operating systems have um, several and perhaps all of these components built into them. Just gonna run through these you know, briefly, make sure we're all on the same page here. So vision, you know, what's your mission, values, goals, standards, where you're going, what's your direction? Metrics, you know, what are your key performance indicators, your objectives and key results, how do we track that? Docs, you know, have you documented your repeatable processes? So important for a company. Issues, how as a group do we come together and discuss and resolve issues? Priority, you know, we need to know what to work on first. You know, how, how is that communicated? People, we want to identify talent, recruit talent, hire talent, train talent, motivate talent. So got to keep track of the people. Limits, everybody needs to know where they fit in. You know, what decisions can they, can they make? What are their limitations? How do we structure that? Decision rights, value-added incentives. Listening, different tools to do this. One-on-one -on -one meetings, uh, feedback, coaching, uh, different tools to, to make sure that you know, information comes up the line as well as down. And then teams themselves, you know, this is where it kind of all comes together. Um, you know, the team's able to break through to the next level. You know, we have used triads, nudges. What, what pieces do we use to create those teams? You know, do they do what they say? Are their behaviors internally consistent? Do they take responsibilities? So these pieces all together are, again, what I see in formal operating systems. Well, are, are these new concepts? No, certainly not. You know, I've seen, um, you know, companies, I mean, for, you know, 100 years or more, you know, companies have been using these concepts in an organized way. And when they, you know, do use them in an organized way, the results can be very powerful. The, the logos you see on the screen, in my mind, share two things in common. One is they consistently have outperformed their competition for extended periods of time. And second, they had very similar operating systems, even if they didn't you know, use that term, they had very similar systems to uh, drive the company and move them forward. You know, the, the UCLA Bruins basketball team, you know, what was it, uh, 10 national championships in 11 years and very structured approach to how they, they did their leadership and, and motivation. You know, Purina, um, you know, everybody's familiar with the dog food. Um, for nearly three decades, year in, year out, Purina significantly outperformed their competition, you know, just about all financial metrics. Um, and, you know, maybe it was how that dog food tasted that made people buy it, but I think there's a little something else. So. You get the idea. So as far as formal operating systems, there's a number of them that are out there right now. Um, you know, just um, different perspectives, different emphasis is, and I'd like to just kind of walk through each of these one by one, just give you a flavor of some of the, the different perspectives on these. Start with traction, EOS, the entrepreneurial operating system. They actually use the term operating system. Um, it's a very, very structured approach, which can be good. Um, covers the basics very well, highly promoted. A couple of things that I really like about this system, vision organizer, you know, pulls together different pieces in a succinct way of where's the company going, what's the direction. Another piece I like is the visionary versus integrator concept. And we'll dig into that just a little bit more further in the presentation. Another one is scaling up, uh, also called the Rockefeller Habits. 
um, like EOS, covers the basics very well. A um, couple of the things that I do like about this approach are the daily huddles. Also the checklist, they have very good checklists to kind of make sure you've gone through the, uh, the different steps. So good prog program there. Uh, one that's based on a very successful company, Coke Industries, you know, perhaps, I don't know if they're still the world's largest privately held company, but certainly uh, up there. Charles Koch, you know, wrote down his, you know, perspective on the keys to running and growing a company. The things that I really like about this, it's very economics focused, the economic decisions are really emphasized, uh, particular decision rights. And I think that's a, a very uh, good thing to kind of highlight in this, this approach. Another approach based on an extremely successful company, of course, is Intel. Andy Grove many years ago was the president of Intel. Um, some of the things he uh, brings out, of course, is the objectives and key results approach that's become widely used in uh, a lot of technology companies, venture capital firms uh, picked up on that. A uh, very powerful tool. And another thing that he brings out in the book is the stages of problem solving. I think that's uh, well done. So that's a good piece. One that brings kind of a different perspective, a more academic perspective is requisite organization. This one uh, really focuses on building organizational structures. You know, the org chart of a company, you know, who's uh, responsible for what, and another related concept is the informational complexity com concept. And basically it's the idea that different people process information differently, but how much information you can process and how far out you can look essentially determines how high in the organization you're capable of performing. So some interesting insights in this uh, approach. Another one that most of you have probably at least heard of is from Gallup. Uh, it's the manager strength finder. They've got a couple different uh, names for the pieces they, they use here, but it's a very highly focused on kind of the soft skills. It's not so much about the structure, very team focused. I like the, the strength finder uh, piece of their, their approach. It's very good. Um, so as you can see, there's a number of different kind of approaches to implementing some structure around um, companies to help them move forward. But of course, my favorite, of course, is the abundant framework. Um, this is a very comprehensive approach. It's implemented through cost-effective online software. The software is currently in private beta, being public beta next month but it's very focused on building adaptable teams. And I'm gonna just dig in just a little bit more. Um, while it's comprehensive and covers all of the different points in the circle graphic that we uh, went through earlier, uh, kind of organize it into five different pieces to make it a little bit more digestible. Mission and values is really knowing where you're going, uh, helping companies to define that, Organizational structure, people need to know where they fit in and they need to know their limits. Structured meetings, communication can be, can be very tough, particularly um, you know, when you've got you know, issues that not everybody agrees on. So we've got to have a structure to help us know what to talk about, identify priorities, and then have those discussions to make good decisions. Feedback. I mean, we've all been in a position where, you know, wanting to get feedback, you know, the boss, uh, they don't talk to us. We, you know, really don't know where we're at. So feedback can be challenging for many bosses, but it can be much easier than people think, you know, if it's structured properly. Um, you know, people, if um, they use basically a, you know, this is the behavior I've seen, this is the impact of that behavior. And then, you know, some uh, thank you type of uh, wrap up there. So, you know, if somebody as simple as, you know, they come in on time, hey, I saw you were in on time today, that really helps the team work together. We have uh, 
better communication. Thank you. Keep it up. That type of feedback is, has been shown through large amounts of research that that is so much more effective than just, hey, you know, good job. You know, it's a very different piece of feedback. So that works really well. There's a little bit more to the whole process, but if you use the positive feedback consistently, it really does set up the ability to change behavior when you have the corrected feedback you need to, to give. Um, process and procedure, you know, repeatable processes have been, you know, part of the industrial scene since, you know, at least the industrial revolution. I mean, if you go look at a McDonald's, you see how important repeatable processes can be for making a very successful organization. So all this uh, is a lot of structure, you know, fairly um, kind of engineering type of uh, approach to the perspective. And it's very important, but it's not the only thing. Attitude is also something that uh, is really important to any organization, to, to moving things forward, motivating people. Um, so a great business operating system, perhaps in combination with a coach, can really lead a transformation in the attitudes of the leadership of the company. Um, leaders, you know, particularly in you know smaller companies where they're the owner, you know, they very much limit the ability of the organization to change, to adapt, and the pace of change the company is able to move forward with. So with that, I'd like to talk about a um, very kind of important distinction between two mindsets. And these are pretty much the two mindsets that I see in the uh, companies that I work with. And the one mindset is that of the expert, uh, whereas the other is the coach. And the expert is very focused on giving an answer, responding to the question. And, you know, honestly, that's what we've been taught in school. You know, you know teacher asks a question, you raise your hand, you give an answer, and you're rewarded for that. And that's fantastic. Um, however, limitations to that when you're a leader. Uh, when you're answering, you're thinking about that answer as you're listening, you're not really listening in the same way as if you're kind of just stepping back and not trying to give an answer. And that's a lot of what the coach is about. It's not the coach doesn't have expertise. Maybe the coach might even you know, have an idea of the answer but the behavior is different. It's not about giving the answer. It's about helping the person to you know, learn and discover the answer. And when you have the, the switch between these two different modes of leaders, there's a whole host of behaviors within the organization that just change dramatically. So experts, you see internal politics, people kind of buttering up to the boss. Whereas in a coaching type environment, you're more likely to see common, you know, focus on a common en enemy, whether that's, you know, we're going to cure cancer or we're going to beat the Celtics or, you know, outperform our, you know, the uh, industry, very different perspective. Similarly with uh, the decision-making in an expert type environment, the financial information is the primary focus for making the decision. Whereas in a coaching environment, it's more about mission and values. And what do I mean by that? So with values, I mean, if you're an individual, you're walking down the street, you decide to pick up a piece of trash and put it in, in the trash can, or you decide to hold a door open for somebody. I mean, there's no ROI for you. You know, there's no, what's your return on investment? That's not a financial decision. That's a values-based decision. So as people, we tend to make values-based decisions. But sometimes when we get into an organization, and let's use uh, Audi as an example. You know, some years back, Audi uh, changed some software to cheat the emissions testing program. And, you know, I think we can all clearly say that that, you know, doesn't sound like a values-driven decision, but if it's a financial, short-term financial decision, you know, I'm sure it saved money, it uh, enabled the uh, engines to be produced cheaper so that the uh, company could make more money right away, and that probably didn't even hurt bonuses. So there's some real differences between these two types of uh, approaches. And as I, you know, I've seen, again, we, you know, with uh, proper coaching and an 
business operating system, I have seen this transformation take place. The other piece I really wanna talk about is the visionary versus integrator role. Some of you may have heard of this. Traditionally, the CEO of a company has the responsibility for both the creating the, the vision, looking for new opportunities, whether in kind of products and technology or in sales, but they also have the responsibility for kind of running the day-to-day -day operations, holding people accountable, achieving goals. And what we find is that, you know, most people don't have an interest in doing both and even, even fewer, you know, have the expertise or the, you know, ability to really do an excellent job in both of these things. And so basically splitting the CEO role into a visionary and integrator role, it allows the company to have the individuals focus on what they're really good at and then the company can move forward and achieve even more by having that specialization. Okay, at this point, um, that gets me through kind of the uh, planned uh, part of the discussion here. I've got some case studies. And so at this point, I'm very happy to uh, take on questions. And uh, if we've got questions, uh, as we go through the case studies, also happy to hear those. Carl, I can't get, I can't type it. This mic, uh, just a, a broad question, but what, what happened? What kind of, uh, I guess, experience you've had when you get to a company and find out that you have an expert and you don't have a coach? How do you how do you bridge that? Right. Um, well, you know, I've, I've seen that many many times. Um, can certainly uh, you know, give a lot of examples of that. And it really depends on the individual and their, you know, their goals, kind of uh, how big of a problem do they have? Uh, if, they've, if they're pretty happy with their situation, they're like, well, I'd like to grow the company, but I don't need to grow the company. Generally, what I've experienced is in those situations, you know, liking, you know, the, the, it would be nice to grow the company if I don't have to change my behavior is kind of the most common situation, in which case, uh, you know, never seen that trans uh, bring about a transformation. On the other hand, if it's a situation where, you know, I've got a goal I feel is very important to reach, I need to get to that goal, what, what will I need to do to get to that goal? In that case, the people are much more open and some combination of, um, you know, coaching, nudging, uh, working with, um, you know, triad groups um, to help the people move forward and, you know, kind of see how coaching can help them uh, has, you know, in, in some cases has been successful. Thanks. I uh, didn't mean to interrupt your case. I'm looking forward yeah. to it. Go ahead. Okay, good. All right. Um, well, one quick so, question in the yep. chat room. It was, uh, can, rev can financial results tell us which type of or organization it is and if the model they are adopting is a good one or a bad one? Um, I've seen very good results for a period of time from, from both situations. I mean, you can be a, uh, you know, kind of an expert type model with a starfish uh, type of business operating system and you know you're in the right market you know you were in you know oil and gas in 2012 and you know the whole what what's uh, Warren Buffett's analogy you know the, the tides in all boats are lifted and you know you did great um, it's really when the tide goes out that you you see the difference you know when you hit 2014 who makes it and who doesn't um so that's um that's where i can have seen financial results kind of tell me what's going on there right okay and then another question came in is is uh, where does compensation and incentives come into play in your abundant framework right right it's uh, very very important um so the uh, compensation 
is really tied to um, a couple of different uh, pieces, but um, defining the uh, responsibilities for each person, you know, is kind of the start of that. So that's creating the organizational structure so people know what they're responsible for, and then creating uh, the kind of KPIs or objectives and key results so they know, you know, okay, how do we measure what they're, they're responsible for? And that leads to both the individual compensation, you know, what's their value add, what's their, um, what metrics are we using to judge their value add, as well as the kind of overall corporate uh, performance as part of the, the incentive as well. Okay, thanks, Carl. Okay. Sounds good. Yeah, let's jump into a case study. I'm sure we'll have more questions as we go. So this particular company, uh, health screening company, was about 15 years, a little over 15 years old when I got involved. Um, the owner had done a good job using the tools and methods he had available to him. He was able to grow the company to about 40 people. Um, but for his, you know, family's sake, really wanted to, uh, you know, have better results, take care of, you know, you know, better care, provide more for the family. So that was his motivation. And so brought Abundant in and we did a number of different things. Um, one of the things we did uh, was focus on the mi mission and values. You know, what is the direction for the company? How are we going to move forward? How do we make decisions? And that took about three months and that didn't take the entire, you know, full focus for that three months, but from start to finish, took that long to kind of put that together using some tools, uh, you know, that are available to help discover and identify those values that are shared by the organization. And once we got it done, you know, it was very well received It kind of brought some, uh, some of the management team into the decision and to, you know, feeling like they're part of making, you know, the company. So that was, that was very powerful. Another piece we added was added one-on-one -on -one listening uh, sessions. So the one-on-one -on -one meetings, uh, particularly for professional or management level people, 30 minutes a week, every week, the manager meets with their, their direct report. And for the first 15 minutes, it's very focused on listening to what the direct reports issues are, you know, whether they're personal, professional, whatnot. And it's not about responding to or having an answer for everything, but simply learning to, you know, take notes, listen, understand, you know, where they're coming from. And then the second half of the meeting is more about the manager saying, okay, you know, these are the tasks, these are the measurements uh, that we need to check giving feedback. Um, and it takes a while for, you know, it takes usually a month or two for those to really have an effect. But after we got those implemented, we really saw some very positive uh, change in attitudes among a couple of the key people in the company. Uh, we implemented structured management meetings. The team, um, you know, had not been meeting regularly. It was kind of sporadic when they would meet. And when they did meet, it tended to be the owner rambling on for, in some cases, very long periods of time. You know, so tended to be a source of frustration. You know, we transformed that into a fixed length meeting every week, very focused on issue discovery, prioritization, and then actually discussing and resolving issues. And, you know, so that uh, was a very popular piece among the senior management team. Uh, we implemented the behavioral feedback, some good success there. We used the uh, organizational structure to identify some key gaps in management and bring some people in. Um, and the result of all this, we were able to expand beyond Texas. Uh, the company had been very Texas focused, moved into other states, increased the profits per location due to better operational processes, and you know, was generally very successful in moving forward and growing the company. Any comments, questions, thoughts? Uh, no. Not yet. All right. All right. And let's see. 
So we had another situation, really an excellent before and after. This is a situation where the company had been running. It was a very small operation um, and family owned uh, small company. Another CEO came in, other family members stepped in and said, hey, this is a good opportunity, let's grow this. And the, uh, the, you know, the new CEO, you know, had a very, you know, business operating system type of approach, you know, put in place management meetings, one-on-one behavioral feedback, built the company, grew it, uh, what was it, over seven, sales grew over 7x in four years. So it was growing very rapidly, serving, uh, you know, especially services to engineering companies all over the world. Um, and, you know, it was just things were going really, really well. But unfortunately, that CEO became permanently disabled, was just unable to contribute to the business. The original CEO stepped back in, took over, pretty quickly eliminated the one-on-ones, the management meeting, all the different pieces that had been put in place. Sales fell approximately 80% within two to three years. So, you know, in the social sciences, I guess you don't have a lot of experiments you can really do. This is about as close as you could get to comparing, you know, the starfish method to a formal operating system. And the results were, were dramatic. Any comments, questions? Okay. So, so, uh, Carl uh, Austin, uh, this kind of, what what prompted the new CEO, CEO to not continue the um, uh, or build on the success that the pre previous CEO had uh, established? That's a good question. Um, it really comes back to attitude. It's you know, really their personality and their perspective. They just didn't see the value uh, yeah. of those things. You know very, um, you know, you know, some say they were, you know, more focused on the now as opposed to kind of having that vision of the future. And, you know, in their mind, you know, it was more efficient for them to make decisions than to build the team to make decisions. And, in a, you know, in a way, yep, the decisions got made quicker and it lowered costs, but Obviously, it chased people off and eventually affected sales. So it's really just personal perspectives. Some people see the, you know, the world differently. And, and a question came in, uh, let's see, is uh, what did you do in this case to, re to revitalize the business? It sounds like you had already left, though, that, that particular business. Is that yeah. correct? Yeah. Um, you know, there that CEO was not interested in feedback. Um, management team actually tried to buy out the company after the, uh, the one CEO became disabled and they were roundly rejected. So um, at that point, um, you know, most of the, yeah, most of the management and key people, you know, went on to other opportunities. Oh, so you had a change in management philosophy and then a change in senior leadership team as well. I mean, if, if, if a bunch of the uh, tenured guys and gals left, huh? Well, you know, after, you know, every, you know, the whole culture of the company, you know, changed within you know, a matter of, I don't know, weeks. And so pretty quickly, you know, the people saw that, you know, what was happening, the change that was coming and it, you know, for the people who've, uh, you know, been in different companies, seen different management styles, they, they knew what was coming pretty quickly. And, you know, the opportunities for quality people are always out there. So people, you know, they stepped away pretty quickly. And so, you know, the, uh, the previous, you know, the CEO that had grown the company was very focused on building pe people, building teams, um, and, you know, he realized that the teams were critical to, you know, the continued success of the company serving the client and, you know, bringing in new business. Mm -hmm. And a related question uh, from the uh, chat box, uh, who brought in the, this new CEO? Um, the, again, they were the, uh, one of the family members, they were the original CEO. 
Um, so it's the um, original CEO, new CEO comes in, original CEO takes over again after the one is disabled. That was a fan. Okay, got it, got it, got it. And then, then Mike had a question. Um, he was wondering if uh, the managers were given uh, are given listening training ahead of meeting with subordinates, um, you know, in, in the abundant model. Or absolutely, absolutely, yes. Got uh, a whole process for that training. Absolutely. That's awesome. Okay, great. Yeah. Um, uh, we've got probably about uh, three, three to five minutes left, Carl. Did you, you, you want to power through the next one or do you want to? Um, no, yeah, we just do a quick one here. Um, okay, we'll take that long. Okay. Um, so got a company, uh, five friends put together a app enabled laundry service. So you, you know, get on your app, click the button and tell them you've got a load of wash uh, sitting on the, the front porch, the van comes by, picks it up, takes it in, washes it, folds it, next day they bring it back and you've got your clean laundry. Um, they got the business up and running, uh, doing, doing well, but what they found out is working as partners was a lot different than talking as friends. And they're having a lot of trouble dealing with some uh, contentious issues. So they brought Abundant in to help with communications. Uh, focused initially on creating uh, management meetings. They really hadn't been having management meetings on any kind of regular basis. Uh, we started slowly, just kind of uh, built, you know, got them used to the structure, dealt with some easy issues, a couple softballs to kind of get it started. A few weeks in, we picked one of the uh, tougher issues and started talking about it. and. Fortunately, we're able to use some, you know, the tools to kind of break down the issue, break down the emotions and different, you know, make sure that all these things are being communicated. We end up resolving the issue. Nobody, uh, nobody strangled each other. And, you know, every, you know, not everybody was pleased with, you know, the answer, but everybody accepted the answer and said, you know, okay, that's going to work. Um, from there, um, started working on the, the mission values piece. Um, let's just say initially there was um, a very healthy level of skepticism as to the value of this effort. And it took about eight weeks to get it done, you know, between, you know, kind of thinking about it, going, you know, iterate through the process. But once we got it done, you know, all five of them said, you know, wow, that, that was a worthwhile effort. I see why we did that now. Glad we did that. And, um, you know, also put in place one-on-ones, org structure, feedback processes, all the other pieces. Um, and so when COVID hit, you know, they definitely had a, a little zig in revenue for, uh, for a couple weeks, but they were able to grow through the downturn. They've uh, since hit some record revenues. And what's very interesting to me is they've actually outperformed one of their VC backed competitors, their, their self-funded company. And so um, I found that one to be an interesting case study as well. So that's probably we. How are we doing on time there? Yeah, we're, we're you know, we got, got a couple of minutes here. I got one question that came in. It uh, uh, was from Mike, uh, who was wondering who you're working with on on developing the system software. Um, so I've got a, a team that's actually spread around the globe. Um, I've started uh, two other software companies, did the initial programming for those. And so I'm, I'm very hands-on involved in the, the coding as, as uh, well as using some other, a number of other resources, um, um, you know, to supplement myself. That's great, uh, man. You, you, you're a man for all seasons, Carl. <laughs> no. <laughs> you I, 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 Carl, I'm impressed uh, that, you know, working with one client that I have been uh, I guess over the last year or so, but it's amazing what you can put together. Uh, sounds like you're doing, he put together India and Russia and a few other places, Peru to uh, put together some stuff. And it sounds like you're doing the same thing. Sounds very similar. Sounds very similar. Yeah. It's, uh, it's odd. You know, some of the, uh, I found Egypt's got a lot of security consult, you know, IT security expertise. So, you know, who would have known? Yeah. yeah, actually, he did work. He worked with somebody out of Egypt as well uh, on some economic modeling, I think. 
So uh, it's a, you know, that's one of the skills that uh, good entrepreneurs are developing, I think. So, well, I, uh, I don't know, Austin, unless you've got any other questions, I, I can wrap up here, I think. Yeah, I think, I think we're good. Uh, for, the, for our audience, anybody else have any questions for Carl? You can chunk into the, uh, the chat box here uh, as, he, as Carl shares his uh, contact information. But uh, Carl, man, this this has been awesome. I, uh, you know, I'm personally very, very familiar with some of those other operating systems, but uh, I'm uh, really excited to see what the uh, final abundant product looks like. It's, uh, it's pretty exciting. That, that is exciting, absolutely. Yeah. Look forward to talking to everybody. I've got I've got a follow up for you afterwards, so uh, I will send you a note uh, on that too, Carl. Excellent. Uh, can we get back to the main program? Yep, absolutely, uh, absolutely. If you can, can you go back to uh, slide two, please, just for a moment to uh, emphasize what? And Jill, I see you're here, so get ready. Your slide four, I think, or five. So, um, in any event, uh, I wanted to touch base. Just happened. By complete happenstance, uh, one more, no, two, two please, first, we'll get Jill in just a second. Uh, three, sorry, three, one more. This one? Una, una mas, one more, three, I said two, it's, it's three. Oh, hey, what, what's on the slide, Mike? <laughs> it, it, the one with, it's number three, V-C-O-F, V, it's, anyway. It says, thanks to our sponsors, that's yes. the slide. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so you got to go down one more. Oh, okay. okay. Oh, we're out of sync. Okay. Yeah, we're out of sync. That was my fault. No worries. No worries. Okay. But I just wanted to touch base on. Uh, okay. okay. Let, let, let me do the bottom of this slide first. That's, uh, this next meeting is August 25th. Uh, we have Greg D. Simone, an out of town guest from Boston, who's with Beacon Equity. Advisors, uh, they have an interesting model uh, in terms of the way they approach uh, actually working with sellers. So I'm looking forward to to that. Uh, thanks to Austin for connecting me uh, there. And then I think uh, September have Wendy Fong. Uh, thanks for Jack uh, connecting me with with Wendy, reconnecting me. Uh, can you advance it one slide there, uh, Austin? How's that? Uh, it, I'm still seeing slide two. Yeah, we're, we're, we're out of sync here for some reason. Uh, okay, can you move the slides at all? Yeah, let me see. Um, they're, 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 they're moving. Here, let me, let me do this. Let me try, try it again. It fr yeah, it just like it froze or something. Yeah. Technical difficulties. Uh, okay. Now, can we go, can we advance a slide? What slide do you see right now? Number two, I'm looking for number three. The, the sponsor slide? Yes, please. Uh, something's wrong, I, I, I see, I'm looking at the sponsor slide, but obviously it's not showing up on your end. Uh, you might try enabling the editing, but oh, put that button go. up there, maybe that'll let you advance it. Yeah, there you go. Enable the editing. There, there's a button at the top of the screen. What, what, what is that? I'm sorry, what's the button called? It says enable enable editing. At least I can see. Yeah, I was trying to click it. It's in the uh, yellow it, banner at the top of the screen. Yeah, there's I don't, a yeah, I don't, I don't see it. Let, let me... Uh, New. Oh, okay. okay, I see what I'm doing. How about now? No, unfortunately not. Uh, somehow it's trying to protect the pro the program, so it's it's frozen it. Uh, so. Okay. Well, uh, I wanted to highlight. Here. Your other alternative is to uh, close the presentation and reopen it and share your screen again. 
Can we try that again? Apologize. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah, I don't have it on my screen, unfortunately. I can't can't pick it up from here. What I'm just curious, what, what's everybody seeing now? Mm, nothing. Yeah, it's I see a box that says resume flight slideshow. Right now it still seems to be frozen. Okay. There you go. See if that'll do it. Anything? Nope. Okay. Okay. All right. Uh, then let me, uh, Jill, I did highlight your, uh, uh, your friend's uh, request. I don't know if you have anything to add to, to that or not, but. Uh, I mentioned this to the group uh, previously. There is a contact of mine that is looking to buy a business. I don't know. If, should I say what the qualifications are again? I put them on the slide, but go ahead. If you want to just hit the, hit the highlight. Sure. Go ahead. So um, five to 50 million in sales revenue, 1 million or more in EBITDA, um, wants a history of positive cash flows, no startups, it could be anywhere in the country, uh, but she would like it to be close to a U.S. business, uh, U.S. Uh, major city. Um, she will actually run it. Um, she's not going to bring in her own team. She'd like to take the team that's currently there and, and grow the business. So she won't be replacing anyone. And she's got some really good financial backing, some family offices around the country um, and some very wealthy individuals that are backing her. She's done this before and it's just interested now in getting another company. So if you all know of um, any company for sale, that'd be great. Um, her industries are really agnostic, uh, but healthcare or food and beverage, she uh, likes those industries. So, um, if you know something in those, that would be great. But anything comes to mind that fits those financial parameters, just let me know and I'll bring it to her attention. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. Okay, well, we'll, we'll wrap up again. And we've got next, next uh, meeting is the 25th and we have an out of town guest speaker. So that will be uh, interesting. Uh, we'll try, I'm trying to figure out how we can get a little bit of uh, and at least highlight people that are uh, with us. Uh, I really missed the uh, opportunity to give people given name, rank, and serial number. Uh, maybe we'll try and figure out some way to use the Zoom process to do that. Uh, and we'll get, we'll get it to let us roll the slides. But um, I want to thank everybody for your time. I want to thank Carl, uh, excellent presentation. Uh, you know, just again, I've been pleased to know you for quite some time. Uh, check out the, the slide number three if you want to. It, it touches on what Carl was talking about in terms of uh, listening and the way you listen. So critical. Uh, I've been listening to Pete Carroll from uh, the Seattle Seahawks, very winning coach. Uh, he, he mentioned Wooten, but Pete Carroll also. And he expresses exactly the same thing that Carl's talking about. Uh, so important, uh, the listening part and, and listening with an open heart and an open mind, it's, it's not just listening to answer. Uh, and finally, uh, check out the last slide if you have your uh, presentation. Everybody loves kittens and uh, we've got some kittens there, uh, but the message is serious. Everything uh, that you ever wanted is on the other side of fear and hopefully it's on the other side of the pandemic. So please, please, Please be safe. Talk to somebody the other day has gone through it. No fun. Not even if you uh, survive, it's no fun. Stay safe, keep your masks on, and uh, we'll see you again on the 25th. Uh, don't forget the, the scholarship. And if you have a chance, we've got uh, a uh, virtual happy hour. Is it this Friday, Bob? This, yes, sir, and this Friday. All right, join us. I see Gretchen's smiling faces of pictures. So hello to Gretchen. Anyway, thanks, folks. Uh, Bob, anything, final comment? I think that's about it. Looking forward to seeing everybody on the happy hour. All see right. you Friday. All righty. Bye.